Well, um, Glenn Mick Rediscovered, and basically it's a brief history of our work recording all the abandoned farms and shielings in Glen Mick. This was part of a, a Scotland's Rural Past project that we started in 2009 and we haven't quite finished yet. If you don't know where Glen Mick is, it's about 45 miles west of Aberdeen, just where the water of Mick joins the River Dee at Ballater. And the Glen runs southwesterly direction um, down to Loch Mick and then east to the Dewloch. Uh, that's it in slightly better detail. And you can see the Glen is, is running into the heart of the range of hills known as the Month, which separates the watershed of the River Dee from the north and south Esk. And like every uh, Glen that runs up into a watershed, there's a mountain pass. In this case, it's the one called the Capel Month. And it was certainly used in droving times. It was important then, but it was important far earlier than that because there is... Uh, some record that a uh, spittle was established there sometime in the 14th, 15th century. Uh, a spittle at that time or a hospital wasn't a place where you went to be made better when you were ill. It was uh, a refuge, a hospice for travellers on the road. And the spittle is at the spittle of Glen Mick. And this is the spittle of Glen Mick as it looks today on a winter's day. The spittle itself is just in that little clump of trees there. And the Capel Month winds its way over the ridge of the hill and, and over at the head of Glen Esk. And you can well imagine that if you're travelling that road in a winter's day, the, the thought of a warm fire and some hot food at the end of your journey must be pretty comforting indeed. This is what it looks like today, but what you see is nothing like the picture you would have seen three, four hundred years ago. All the trees in that picture are 19th and 20th century plantations. If you'd gone there about 1800, all you might have seen was some scrubby birch and alder and willow down by the burnsides and very few other trees. The only inhabited house in the Glen now is the ranger's house, which is tucked in that uh, clump of trees. That's the only inhabited house above the Lynn of Mick. If you'd been there 200 years ago, you would have seen an awful lot more buildings and an awful lot more people. This is the uh, visitor centre at Glen Mick. Uh, I suppose most of you will be familiar with this. There's about 100,000 people every year walk past the visitor centre and come along the track here and go off and climb Glen Mick or, or walk around the loch. Very few of them pay any attention whatsoever to that little odd bump in the grass there. And I must admit, for about 50 years of my life, I didn't look at it either. But it is, in fact, the remains of the old drovers in. And you may think that's very old, but Johnny Robertson, who's still alive, can remember that as a semi-derelict building, two stories with a cobbled floor. So, not very long ago, that was where the drovers were staying as they made their, their trek over the Capel Month and, and down south with their sheep and cattle. Now, Glenn, the head ranger at Balmoral, was well aware there was a lot of archaeological interest around the spittle, uh, and he wanted to transmit this to, to the visiting public. So he needed a lot more information, and he thought, who better to turn to for expert advice than Arkham's Royal Commission for Ancient Historic Monuments Scotland. And they said, great, we've got just the thing for you. We've got the scheme called Scotland's Rural Past. And he said, does that mean you're going to send a bunch of experts up here to do it? They said, no, we'll find some amateurs and we'll train them and they'll do it. And that's basically what happened. So instead of expert advice, what Glenn got was about six relatively novices who had an awful lot to learn, but they gave us decent training and learn we did. And when we looked around the spittal, we found the remains of 17 buildings. There's the old drovers in down there, and the rest are scattered round about here and up the side of the burn. And they come in a variety of shapes and sizes. Some look just like this, just a, a, a bump in the turf. And we think that's probably just the foundation course of a building that would have had tough walls. Others have obviously got dry stone construction. And also we found this, which is a corn drying kiln. Now if there's a corn drying kiln, that means people are growing cereal crops nearby, which means they're actually living full time up at the spittle, which in this day and age seems very remote and inhospitable. But there were people living there all year round in, in the historic past. 
Well, the information we'd been able to gather from, from the, uh, the, the ruins round about the spittal, uh, Glenn was then able to put together this, this leaflet. And what you can do now is if you come up to Glen Mick, you can pop into the visitor centre, pick up this leaflet. It's got numbers, little numbered pegs at all the various stops. And if you turn the leaflet over on the back, there's a description that tells you what these ruins were and what the buildings were used for and how many people lived there, etc. So it's a way of transmitting that information that as archaeologists we can instantly understand to the general public who might have trouble de dealing with a, this strange concept. Glenn also commissioned this artist's impression of what the spittle might have looked like around 1800. Now, there is an element of conjecture in this because we don't know that all the buildings were occupied at the same time. In fact, probably they weren't. What people tended to do was live in one building till it got fairly ruinous, build another one next door and then, and then move. But nonetheless, you can see the, uh, the drovers in here. There's the corn drying kiln and the range of other buildings around there. What we don't know is what might have been in this area here, because this is where the ranger's house and the mountain rescue bothy is, and whatever remains might have been there in the past was obviously bulldozed away when they made the foundations for the current house. And if you visit Glen Mick now, you'll actually walk along the track that comes past here, and then turn up towards Glen Mick. Well, we ticked all the boxes that were of our original task. We'd, uh, we'd surveyed the spittle and we'd found, uh, we'd found the buildings and we'd packaged the information so Glenn could pass on the information. So we thought, you know, what else can we do? Are, are there more ruined buildings in Glenmick? Can we go and have a look at them? And the answer is, yes, there's an awful lot of ruined buildings in Glenmick. Um, this map shows all the sites that we have surveyed since 2009. Um, a lot of them are permanent settlements. There seems to be a habitation almost every kilometre down the glen. And up here there's a scatter of summer shielings and then more permanent settlements down, down there. How big were these settlements? How many buildings? How many people lived there? The information was fairly scant if you looked at the records. I haven't got time to go through all these, but I'll share two of them with you. Uh, we'll look at Titabuti and we'll look at uh, Clashmick and Ochna Craig. This is Titabuti. It's about a kilometre north of the Spittal. Uh, the only thing that was recorded about this was basically two sentences. One says, appears in the first edition ordnance survey map, and the other sentence said, what appears to be two long houses appear in an oblique aerial photograph. That was it. Nobody had been anywhere near there to check to see what was actually there. And it's literally a stone's throw from the main tarmac road running up Glen Mick. And the rest of the information about all the other settlements was of much the same order. This is what you'll find at Titabuti if you look around. The uh, main cluster of houses is there. There's another two enclosures with two houses there, which we suspect might have been used in the droving period because you can enclose sheep and cattle overnight in the enclosure with the drovers rested in the inn. Um, there's a corn drying kiln. It's lost in the woods now. You've got to go looking for it, but it's there. And this is what the main uh, cluster of settlements looks like. Um, there's the longhouse, which in fact is a buyer dwelling because it's got two doors, humans at this end, cattle at that end, that end because that's the downhill end and the brie flows out through a little hole in the wall and goes away from where the humans live. And the other long house, in fact, was a short house which has been extended twice. And here's a winnowing barn and, as I've said, a corn drying kiln. So this was, again, permanent habitation. But as well as looking at the, uh, the uh, relics on the ground, one of our members, Linda, was also looking at uh, the Invercold archive. And what she found was this little script. And it says, I promise and obliges me, John Fraser in Titabuti, to build a stone dike round the said town and lands that are to be taken in and brought under corn and grass at that place. And it's dated Whitsunday, 1768. Now, we can't tell from that if Titabuti was already settled and was being expanded, <coughs> 
or if this was a new settlement. We do know from records from other areas that there was such pressure on land in this period of history that places that had been used only for summer shealings were being permanently settled. And there's a fair chance that Titabuti was one of them. So at 1786, we've got a permanent settlement, at, or at least an enlargement of a permanent settlement at Titabuti. Further down the glen <coughs> is Ochna Craig and Clash Mick. This is Clash Mick here, and Ochna Craig over there. Ochna Craig, of course, means field of the crag. And when the Ordnance Survey came along, they took the name for the field and gave it to the hill. And it should really be Crag Nanoch, but they got it wrong. Um, if you can just imagine that map just rotated very slightly clockwise. Here we are, Clashmick and Ochna Craig there. This is the factors map from 1809. The land at that time belonged to Invercold Estate and the Laird employed a consultant factor to come and map his land and assess all the rents he was collecting from his tenants and work out if he could actually make more money out of the deal. And the factor was not very complimentary. Uh, here it says, poor cold land, rough stony grass, rough pasture. And the upshot of, of all this survey work was that the factor went back to the Laird and said, look, these people can barely feed themselves, let alone pay you a decent rent. What I suggest you do is amalgamate all these small farms together and let it out as one big sheep grazing. And from what we can gather, that's exactly what he did. Because we know from this map that this area was inhabited and indeed cultivated in 1809. And we know from the 1841 census that no one lived there. So it looks as if the, the period of tenure in some of these places, including Titabuti, 17... What did I say? 1768, and abandoned by 1841. So they only lived there for about 100 years. Uh, this is Clash Mick. Again, it's got a winnowing barn and a corn drying kiln. This is what it looks like today. Uh, the winnowing barn is there, and you can see the rig and fur cultivation that radiates out along the slope from beneath the, the, the settlement. This is Ochna Craig on a good day. It's at 1,200 feet above sea level, that's uh, 4, 400 meters. And if you can imagine spending a winter up on Ochna Craig, you're a tougher soul than I am. I think I might have been quite ready to move when the fact I said you've got to go. As well as the permanent settlements, we found quite a number of shielding remnants up in the hills, some of them fairly skeletal, you know, just. A corner of a wall, that's all we could find. Others much more substantial and, and pretty obvious. Some very well preserved when you could find them, but they weren't easy to find. This is a still house. It's tucked away in a tiny little gully right up at the head of a, a glen, out of sight of the excise man. And this is obviously the main production center for the whiskey that was notoriously smuggled south over the Capel Month Road in the dead of night on pack ponies. Or so the story goes, anyway. We found several of these. So there was a, definitely a whiskey industry in Glen Mick. In fact, that was the main source of income. Hence the corn drying kilns and the winnowing barns, because without barley, you can't make whiskey. So what do we do with all this information? Well, we just brought out a splendid new book, which is <coughs> lavishly illustrated, and it's on sale here today <laughs> for only four pounds at the back of the room. Come and talk to us at coffee breaks and lunchtime. You can't really go home without this. It would make a perfect little stocking filler for all your friends who go hill walking at Glen Mick, and it's a complete bargain. And if you ask nicely, the entire team will sign it for you because our lead author, Linda, <laughs> is sitting in the back of the, uh, back of the audience there. Um, not only that, but coming very soon is our teacher information pack. If any of you are involved in education, we've put together a, a pack specifically for schools and teachers, uh, which will be ready in the new year. But we've got a leaflet describing what we're going to do. So come and pick up a leaflet and speak to us. I can see Pierce approaching me, so I'm probably at the end of my time. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs> <laughs>